a true story. When I ran for Congress the first time in 1974, which was a terrible year to run, and a sign that I don't have any sense of timing. And it was the middle of Watergate, and Nixon was collapsing. And to be a Republican in Georgia, running against the dean of the Georgia delegation and the fourth ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, was just kind of, it was not smart. Uh, and, uh, but we did one thing that saved my candidacy, and I, I got 48.5% that year, which was good enough to come back and run again. Uh, by the way, the second time I ran, Jimmy Carter was at the head of the Democratic ticket. <laughs> And I ran the best campaign of my career, and we went from 48.5 to 48.3. The third time I won, uh, which is a proof that while I may, I may not have good timing, I'm really persistent. But the thing that saved us in 1974 was we adopted the principle that we would concede to my opponent his immediate family. But we wouldn't concede anything else. So. For example, we went into his hometown of Griffin, Georgia, and we opened a campaign headquarters. And we worked very hard in Griffin. Well, all of a sudden, on Labor Day, I get a call. And you, you couldn't write this into a novel. This is why I'm, I'm a historian, because these things really happen, but they don't, you, they don't make sense in a novel. I get a call from his next door neighbor, who had had a really bitter property fight. And they'd gone to court with each other. And he hated Congressman Flint. And he said, I want the largest yard sign you have. <clears throat> because I want the last thing he sees driving home and the first thing he sees driving away to be your name. Now, I didn't have a very big campaign fund that year, because it was not a very good year to give money to Republicans. But I was a college teacher, and I had lots of students who were volunteers. And so we sent a bunch of the guys out back. And they, they got a plywood board, four by eight. And they painted a unique sign for this yard. And we went over, and we put this, and I don't know if it got us any votes, but just the picture of this four by eight sign next to his home raised the morale of all of our volunteers in the whole region. <laughs> now, now I tell you that to come back to the cities. <clears throat> American solutions is not conservative solutions. It's not Republican solutions. It's not about fixing small towns. It's not about fixing the suburbs. American solutions is about the idea that our Declaration of Independence is right. We are endowed by our creator with certain animal rights. That means if you're an African American in downtown Detroit, you deserve the same effort from us to try to find solutions. And I, by the way, am keynoting the Detroit Chamber of Commerce on how do you fix Detroit. It means that we have a project on prisons, which has actually attracted attention from the NAACP Legal Fund, because we have a three-part question. Can we find policies in your neighborhood so you never become a prisoner? Can we find a faith-based solution so if you are a prisoner, you actually are converted to being a good citizen and you learn a skill and you leave prison better than you entered? And can we help you once you leave so you never go back? Now, it turns out there are a lot of folks in inner city America who have never heard a Republican say that. And it's never occurred to them that a Republican would actually care about their son or their daughter or their grandson or their husband. And so I think, we have, I think the first, Jack Kemp had it perfectly. He said they have to know that you care before they care that you know. So I think we should have a commitment at American Solutions to reach into every precinct, and every neighborhood and try to help people find how they can pursue happiness and how they can pursue the opportunities that God has given them within the framework of American history and the way America has historically worked.